Welcome back to Watchbox Studios and the Watchbox. I am your host, Tim Masso, and this is Watches Tonight. This evening, I'm talking about $5,000 watches that I love. Uh, a new Blancpain 50 Fathoms, which has just been released. All of that watch price bubbles to um, watch and your watch collector wrist shots. Remember, the folks who put me here, thewatchbox.com, also have a home on the web. It is the new redesign to thewatchbox.com. Open another window, keep me streaming. The best window shopping you can do. And see that? See what I did there? It, open a window and window shop? You're gonna like what you see. 3,000 newly purchased, pre-owned, vintage watches. Everything you're gonna find there is pretty much outstanding. I recommend De Batoon. Now, jumping into Tim Masso on Facebook and Instagram. My other platforms, visit me after the show. Uh, these are, after all, one minute reviews. You're gonna like them. You can daisy chain my roughly 1,400 videos together and watch my Instagram page for hours. All right, let's check out viewer wrist chats number one. And the chat box first. We got Blue Shirt Boo to get out of. We got Kevin at E. We've got Richard Combs from South Florida. Kevin joining in from Sydney, getting up early with us. Joe Pinto from Louisville, Kentucky. We've got Joseph Z joining in from California. John N. We've got Daniel Waxman from Denver. That's where my sister lives. Joe Tyson. We've got Dr. Stu in the box. We've got MCC Le Chinois, Alex O. We've got Alex N. We've got Lloyd K. from Maryland. Let's see what you guys are saying. Alex is saying, can't wait to get the JLC I bought from you guys so I can add my wrist shots. I'm looking forward to that. I will be looking for that shot. Terry C. joining in. Eddie Landsberg and Geezer staying up late with us in London. All right, guys, let's launch straight in. The wrist shots we have for this evening. Here's the first five. Francisco G. and Josie the Bulldog go high horology, sporting the Debatoon DB28 Digital and the MBNF LM101. Very cool, and that's a very trustworthy dog, I have to say. Simon H. shares his watch box bought Rolex Yachtmaster as his doggy recovers. Apparently, the little pup had an ACL injury. I know it's baseball spring training season. I didn't know the dogs were also susceptible to that common baseball malady. Joseph Z. and Scarlet Chocolate Lab share his Rolex GMT Master 2 on the couch. Another very, very trustworthy pooch. Matt S. of Columbus, Ohio, rocks a solid gold 1955 Audemars Piguet with Boba the dog in the background, who apparently also has a Star Wars collar, so is fully themed. And then David D. of Pennsylvania, a nearby boy, relaxes with Clyde the Boston Terrier and his Rolex Submariner. In case you missed, this was our dog theme for the evening. Guys, send me your wrist shots, Monday mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Let's see who else has just joined us. Jean-Claude Beaver, Abdul is joining in from Germany. We've got Wolfgang K also joining us from continental Europe, staying up late with us. We've got Derek M joining in from Austin, Texas. And Wolfgang is gonna be specific here, not just continental Europe, he's joining us from the land of Austria the seat of empire. All right, Marco Bernardi is joining in and we've got Denez Varga from Budapest. Okay, also staying up late with us. Let's talk about the new Blancpain 50 Fathoms because we've got a new one. And the first thing that I need to say right out of the gate is this is not the upcoming new 50 Fathoms of which I've spoken extensively on this show. We know the 50 Fathoms 5015 came out in 2007. That core watch has been around for a really long time, especially since it's a 45 millimeter, which is increasingly out of step with how people choose to wear their watches and buy their watches these days. This is there to tide you over. The latest in a long series of 50 Fathoms limited editions, this model is an extension of the reference 5008 collection, which is 40.3 millimeters. Now, this is the no radiations. It's a tribute to the vintage watch that was marked as such to alleviate the concerns, primarily of civilian buyers. So in multiple markets, no radiations, which is a wonderful corruption of two different languages, as well as the no radiation symbol were displayed on the dial, primarily during the 1960s. Now that, that's what it would have looked like historically. That's not the new watch. And this is actually the second recent watch paying tribute to the no radiations era of Blancpain and LIP Blancpain dials. What can I say here? Well, 
this watch is smaller, obviously, than the standard 50 Fathoms, but it's not uniquely compact, as there have been quite a few of these. In 2017, we got the Mil Spec, which was a 500-piece series. In 2018, we got the Ocean Commitment, which was a 250-piece series. In 2019, we got the Barracuda, and in 2020, we got the Hodinkee, which was the Mil Spec again, but in a shorter edition run with a brushed case and no date. All of which is to say, these 40.3 millimeter limited editions are almost an annual occurrence at this point, and they have been for the last half decade. So here's the question. At $14,100 for this new 50 Fathoms No Rad for 2021, is this 500 piece limited edition comparable to the Rolex Submariner? At face value, there is some crossover. Both models originally came out in 1953, and obviously they were close, but Blompat did take the crown as the first modern format dive watch. They're similar in size today, as the Rolex is now a 41 and the Blompat is a 40.3. Obviously, both diving time pieces, and I should say, although they're not close in price new, at the prices people are paying right now for a standard sub with a date, that's the 2021 model, you know what? That's a $9,150 watch that's becoming a $14,000 to $15,000 watch, which means the $14,100 price of the Blancpain makes it similar to what a lot of people are going to be paying for the Submariner. So at the end of the day, do I think this is a real competition or even a baby rivalry? No. You're going to see 500 of these, and Rolex is going to make tens of thousands of the subs. But if you do have that kind of money in your pocket, at least up to 500 customers, it's a choice that you have to make. Which one would I pick? Well, frankly, I like the movement of the, the Blancpain. Not only does it have a nice movement, not the toughest movement, but a handsome one with a 100-hour power reserve, and you can see it. That's a key thing. Being able to see your movement in a high-end watch matters. This one's worth seeing. The Rolex Caliber 3235, probably not worth seeing. What else? Straps are polarizing, but I have to say that the option to put your mil spec, your ocean commitment, your no rad on a strap, and look natural, that's something I like. And I don't think the sub really has that. You need to find an integrated strap from Rubber B or Everest. Whereas with the Blancpain, it looks natural on a strap, and it really works the way I like to wear my watches. I would also say, realistically, loom is phenomenal. With the sapphire capped bezel, you get a fully loomed bezel, which means it's got a nighttime aspect that really is unique to these 50 Fathoms models, whether big or small. And this one continues in that tradition. The Fotina is going to be contentious. I'm not going to lie here. Uh, this is something that is becoming increasingly a flashpoint. The way refinishing watches is increasingly becoming a collector flashpoint. I think Fotina is probably on its last legs as an industry trend. But I also think that here, as a complementary color to the yellow, uh, maybe it softens the dial a little bit. I think Fotina as a, as a gimmick is, is lame, but as a complementary color, sometimes it works. And here it does warm up the dial a little bit. And because it is a vintage theme, it's not completely heretical. All the same, I would do without. But I love to see yours. Your wrist on my list, viewer wrist shots number two. Okay, Jay from LA proves that there's more to steal Patek Philippe than the 5711. With his 5212A weekly calendar looking good, I love the font on that dial. Wachusiest, yep, that's his name, you can find him online, captures his H Moser and C Streamliner flyback chronograph with a blue fume fade dial. And take note, there's also a racing dial staggered track outboard. A lot to love about that Moser Streamliner. It draws from the 70s, but not the Gerald Genta 70s, and that's what I love about it. Jeff M. South Carolina walks the beach with his Zenith Chronomaster Revival Liberty Edition for the U.S. market. And Macal B. of Poland proves that the green Omega Aquaterra is definitely more interesting than your box stock Rolex Datejust 41. Looking good at the wheel of his Renault. He's an F1 fan, just as I am. Paul D. of Vermont treats us to a lovely winter action shot of his Rolex Explorer on skis. And then Robert E. and his JLC Reverso prepare for this year's Reverso 90th anniversary. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. We've got Thomas Burnett commenting on the earlier Debatoon sighting, saying he absolutely loves the DB28 Digital. So do I. I'm trying to hold out for the slightly smaller case of the DB27 Polo, but Debatoon's got to make that watch for me because it was a 10-piece limited run. They made a prototype, they never made the 10. So I'm pushing them 
to make at least one of those for me because it would be the perfect watch. Let's see who's joining in. Edward Ledden of Sweden saying, happy March 15th to my fellow Hungarians today. Right here we've got Daniel Waxman saying, the durability of the movement, I assume he means the Blancpain, is sort of a deal breaker for me. If I'm buying a luxury sports watch diver, I need a durable movement so I can wear it daily. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, now that that movement is, is, is robust, free sprung with a silicon hairspring, you're going to really have to do something violent to break it. Like to the point where if you hit the watch in the process of damaging a movement internally, you're probably going to damage the case too. So I, I think it's important to know the limits of your watches, but I'd say nine out of 10 times when a sports watch with a delicate movement gets damaged, it's not because they did something like white water rafting or jogging or you know playing catch or you know throwing the frisbee to the dog. Oftentimes it's, it's three things really. It's, it's guns, it's golf, and it's tennis. Uh, so I think you'll be fine, honestly, with these 40 millimeter Blancpains. I know the full-size watch with the 13-15 the movement is sturdier, but I also think for the most part, luxury watches that live on the wrist live luxury lives. And unless you do plan to do something really concussive, and I mean like, uh, I, I mean like the hammer game at a carnival, it should be okay. I don't think you have to worry about it that much. Joe Tyson saying, I'm not a fan of Fotina myself. What else we got going on here? Lloyd Kerr saying, I like the 50 Fathoms better, but I like the dials with stuff on them. Okay, well, you know, you're going to be happy. There's been a long run over five years of 50 Fathoms dials with stuff on them, from the Ocean Commitment logo to the Moisture Indicator to the No Rad. And then right here, let's see, da-da-da. We have Turkish Meister joining in from Turkey, saying, I am a watch Zeus. I'm going to take that as a compliment, but my, my sister had like this little poofy dog named Zeus. So whenever I hear Zeus, I think of the little Pomeranian she used to have. Uh, I like her pug more. She's got a pug now. Abdul saying, F1 testing last week was great. Any news on the RM Ferrari watch for F1? You know what? We're going to have to wait. That'll be a big one, and I'm also willing to bet with a big price. What else is going on? We've got Quarters Eye. Tim, I'm a big Chrono Swiss fan, but I noticed there's very little love for the brand. Why is that? I think for the most part, people who love Chrono Swiss love the old Chrono Swiss. The company went under in about 2011, 2012, and G.R. Long, who founded the company, hasn't really been guiding the newer product. Well, they've been smart to issue heritage watches, which are sort of limited run reissues of their old 1990s and 80s models. What people really want are old Old models like you know the masterpiece chronograph like the Delphus jump hour they don't want some of the newer stuff which is very large loud um, some would say garish it doesn't fit the image of chrono swiss which was a german company building in the swiss tradition gr long's watches were like that today i think they're just so different from what they used to be it's almost like roger dubuis where in the 90s they were gorgeous and they brought in a customer you know who would buy franck muller when they were at their peak or patek philippe or vacheron and today that kind of customer doesn't even think of roger dubuis the watches are nice but they're nice and big they're crazy they're outlandish they're not the type of watch that used to appeal to that customer. And I think it's the same way with Chrono Swiss. The people who are into the brand, more often than not, tend to be into the old watches made, you know, 15 to 30 years ago. So I think that's the best answer I've got for you. Now, here's the thing, guys. We are in crazy times. Absolutely crazy times. Yes, I know. Global pandemic, economic dislocations. But here's the thing. For folks who've been deep into this hobby for a long time, you know that odd things are happening with watch prices, and they don't necessarily track one for one with the Sturm und Drang out in the world at large. It's not just watches. Here's the thing. I'm not sure why $5,000 is a magic number, but it just came to me today, and I'm going to try to right a wrong that the market has imposed over the last two years, especially over the last six months. So right now, have you noticed the madness that is set in across both national borders and investment classes. Yeah, watches are where we live. We're all about the watches in the watch community and it's where our attention is directed. But we're also seeing inflation of house values up 15% in a year in the United States, and that's just an average. Collector cars, I've watched the price of some cars go up 30, 50, 75, even 100% in the last year. Cryptocurrencies going absolutely nuts, almost regardless of 
their underlying fundamentals. Uh, and then non-fungible tokens, a crypto-like technology tied to the ownership of digital art. That too is breaking the bank. All of this is happening. And of course, the prices of certain watches are following suit. I remember when that was a $20,000 watch. I remember like 18 months ago when that was like a $25,000 watch. So what's going on right now? Well, here's the thing. A one word comes to mind when you realize that the 5711 has tripled in value. Mm-hmm, that's what I'm thinking too. Yeah, the 5711 is now a $100,000 watch, and while there are many forces at play to make that happen, it's not unique to that watch, and it's not even unique to watches. So $5,000 is the number that came to mind. I want to just fly in the face of the idea that you've got to spend six figures to have fun. Fly in the face of the idea that you've got to spend five figures to have fun, and highlight some watches that I really love, because I've spent a lot of time stressing in the last year on this show about committing to watches and cars whose value have pushed into bubble territory. Because what we're seeing in all of these markets is not inflation. Even at the peak of US inflation from like 1979 to 1981, you were looking at like 10 to 12 percent a year. And all of these crazy luxury asset classes are now well beyond that. This is an inflation. It's the bubble phenomenon that we've come to know well over previous cycles. So let's forget that and have a ton of fun with $5,000 watches that aren't going to raise your blood pressure, imperil your solvency, or destroy domestic relationships. We're going to have some fun here, and I want you guys to suggest in the box what kind of $5,000 and less watch you can recommend to watch collectors who just want to have fun. Now, you don't need to worry about chasing a market because the values of these watches I'm going to show you are all stable. You won't need to stress about bubble bursts because they're not currently in a bubble condition. And if you can't stand mainstream obsessions on social media, just about all of these watches are known for keeping a pretty low profile. So if you've seen those videos of people getting robbed in LA and RMs worth $500,000 ripped off the wrist. Chances are, these are not those watches. So, let's get started with a brand name. You know, Rolex is the ballyhooed name of the moment, but its traditional rival is Omega, and Omega offers economic miracles. Depreciation works for you when you buy most Omega models. So let's start with a personal favorite of mine, the Seamaster Aquaterra in steel, and let's go with the midsize, 38.5 millimeters, because I still think that is just about perfect for a men's watch. This offers everything. First, let's talk price. $8,400 is what it costs to buy one of these new. But you can find them used at just under $5,000, which makes this a phenomenally good deal. And also, if you're that guy who gets skittish about losing money on a watch, realistically, buy this watch used, sell it privately, and you will have owned and enjoyed it for nothing more than the price of servicing it and maybe adding a strap. So, fantastic fit with the midsize case. That's it on my wrist. I think this is a great option for those who think that 41 and up is just too big for a watch that you would wear as a dress timepiece. And you can wear the Aquaterra as a dress watch. It is, after all, the Aquaterra, the sea and the land. It's the surf and turf watch that's equally at home on the deck of the yacht or in the ballroom of the yacht club. And because it's still a Seamaster, it's 150 meters water resistant, fully loomed, stainless steel, and automatic winding. So you're getting a lot of capability here. Throw it on a strap and watch it transform. Remember I said I liked my watches on straps? That's an Omega factory NATO strap with steel branded hardware. So you can really change the look of this watch if you want to mix it up. Do you want to go festive? Do you want to go sober? This watch can do both. That's the miracle of the Aquaterra. And with five-year warranties, a lot of these things are still out on the market with two, three, four years of warranty extant at a time when two years new is still the industry standard warranty duration. I'll also mention it has a display case back. And while it's a mechanically finished movement, it's still kind of fun to be able to see the coaxial escapement with a loop and see it, you can. So this is a great example of how you can get into a major brand and a major model line and even a complication. And if you're one of those one watch guys who's looking to wear just one watch in the shower, to bed, to work, to the beach, this is that watch. You found your match. Get it in a black dial, get it in a silver dial, get it in a blue dial, but I think you're gonna like what you see. And it is an annual calendar. Now, right here we have Birth and Design saying, today's my birthday and I finally caught this from the start. Coincidence? I think not. Birth and happy birthday from my team to you. We've got Tanzil saying, excited for the Aston Martin F1 team this year. I was a previous Racing Point and Force India F1 fan. All right, continuing the, the thread of competition, I too 
was a fan of those setups, and I always thought they punched above their weight, especially in the Force India days. I'm a huge Aston Martin fan. I would love to see them do well, burn lots of Lawrence Stroll's money, and you know, get some results while doing it. What else do we have here? We have Alex saying Merck is still the team to beat. McLaren looking good. Ferrari not making much progress. You know, the 2010s were a lost decade for McLaren. I would love to see them competitive because I can tell you, on the road car side right now, they are hurting. They're talking about selling their headquarters and then becoming a tenant of the new owner. So McLaren could use some good news in 2021, and I'm hoping that happens. I'm a McLaren fan dating back to the Mika Hakkinen days. And then let's see what else you guys are saying. This chat box moves fast, and I want to make sure I'm talking in, in step with your comments. Uh, Mark S. from Brooklyn asking, what watch does your sister wear? Zin, like your folks? I bought them Zins, but I got her the Swatch Pug watch because she has the Pug, and she's not that into watches. So I didn't want to damn like a Zin to a life of you know, complete destructive neglect. <laughs> so I got her the Swatch Pug watch, and if that's still running in a year, I'll get her a Zin. All right, let's see what else you guys are saying right here. We got Morgan Cook saying, is there any chance the Tudor discontinues the 41 millimeter Black Bay and makes the 58 the standard? I doubt that. I don't see them discontinuing the bronze watch in 43 or the standard 41. I, I think they're gonna try to spread their sales over as many references as possible so they don't wind up with a bottleneck. And as long as there's demand, they're gonna continue to amortize that tooling. So I expect them to sell those case sizes as long as those case sizes are selling. Jay Bo Surf joining in from Adelaide, Australia, and we got Detroit Spartan joining in. What's up, Maso? Nice jacket. Thank you very much. It is my favorite color, you may have noticed. All right. Let's talk about another Omega that I love that you can buy for less than $5,000 in an era of inflated prices, especially inflated prices on vintage watches, base metal watches, and sports watches from major brands. The Speedmaster Professional X33 is a breath of fresh air. This is the best pilot's watch Omega ever made. And yes, it's better than the current Skywalker because that watch is incomprehensible. You would, I, I compare learning the functions of the Skywalker, and I mean all the functions. It's like learning the emergency procedures for for learning this, for, for like landing a space shuttle in the midst of a system failure, or like the emergency procedure manual for your 747 pilot. It's just crazy. This is actually pretty intuitive. You can pick it up and you can be underway in about five to 10 minutes without even reading the manual. And yet you still get literally every function you could want, a backlight, analog, digital, an 80 decibel alarm, a countdown timer, an alarm, a chronograph, two time zones, all of that, and again, super intuitive to use and just really sharp. They called it the Mars watch, which might have been a bit precipitous, but I'll tell you this, if there had been a Mars mission in the 2000s, that's the watch that would have flown. I'll also say this, this is a watch that is titanium on a full bracelet, and you can buy it for under three grand. You're getting a lot of value here. You're also getting a watch that underperformed when new. So while it's not rare, it's also not so common that the market treats it with contempt or collectors treat it with contempt, or people talk about how we have too many X33 special editions. That's not a thing. It's a thing with moon watches, but it's not a thing with Mars watches. So this is a watch that's still rare enough that if you show up wearing one at your watch club, it's still pretty unique and cool. Not like bringing in, you know, a ridiculous Patek Philippe complication like a 5968 Aquanaut that's rare because it costs a billion dollars and the wait list is years long. This is rare because it was a niche piece and that translates to cool. I'll also say that this is a watch that's now a borderline vintage option given that the first ones came out in 1998 and the last ones officially made for the public were sold in 2006. So you're talking about a watch that is now old enough that it actually fits in with some watches made in the tritium dial era in the late 90s. So that's pretty neat, considering these still run, Omega still provides parts, and these are still everyday serviceable at local Omega centers around the world. Try that with hardcore vintage watches. Moreover, uh, these are watches that I have to say, all together, um, the market is very appealing. You've got options, and you could spend anywhere from about $2,000 to get one on a strap to about $3,000 to get the best one in the world, box and papers, on a bracelet, never polished, never touched. I would also say that if you are looking, the, the only real difference, yeah, there's the Mark I, there's the Mark II, but for me, the only real substantive difference is the caliber uh, 1666D. It was the fourth series movement put in those watches, and it's the only one that's thermocompensated 
Limited, and that would be my pick personally. Let's see what you guys are saying right here in the chat box. Do do do. We got Time Hill saying, "I love the Aquaterra," and you know what? I am with you there. It's not just the annual calendar. There are other models that are really neat. The Platinum World Timer and the Steel World Timer. And Wolfgang, I know you're in the box and you're a big fan of the World Timer. Let's see what else you guys have to say. Butik1 from Poland is saying, Tim, who cares about all the functions of the X33? It just looks super cool. I wear my Solar Impulse Limited Edition with a lot of joy, using only its basic three hands and maybe date in the background. Uh, you know what? That is super cool. Uh, I totally am with you on that. It looks like a million bucks. The X33 is the $3,000 watch that looks like a $30,000 watch on your wrist. Also, we've got right here, Eric Nielsen saying, every watch get together I attend the Aerospace from Breitling, which is all also a digital analog multifunction, is the watch that more people play with than any other. I am right with you there. And then we've got a comment from Hans on the Caliber 1666, the number of the beast. Nice Iron Maiden reference. You don't get this on Hodinkee. All right, heavy metal on your wrist. Viewer wrist chats number three. Tom B shoots watches and wheels with his Omega Planet Ocean and his Jeep Wrangler. Uh, looks like a JK generation there. We've got Gareth Z of London shares his grandfather's 1925 Longines on a Jean Rousseau strap with a picture of Grandpa. Joel D of New York features his Urban Jurgensen Alfred on a classic calfskin strap, looking really nice there. That, that is an awesome slight cuff overlap. Well done, very well done, Joel. Kyle A of Ottawa and Hannibal the dog relax with the latest Rolex Submariner no date. Look at that dog staring longingly at the object of human desire. That's like man and beast of one mind. And then we've got Tycho, impressing with a rare Reverso chronograph retrograde in his green Chevy Camaro. You know I am a fan of American performance cars, and I'm a big fan of the hugely underrated Reverso Grand Sport chronograph. I wish you'd sent me two wrist shots, one of each side. I would have posted both of them. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Time Hill saying, I have to look at the X33. Highly recommend. Thomas Burnett, complimentary of the image of the Longines, and why not? That's one of the best pure photos I've seen on this show. Okay, let's talk about $5,000 Rolex. That's right. I said $5,000 Rolex and vintage Rolex at that, and here's why. Well, you might not be able to get any standard steel Rolex on a timely basis or on the aftermarket at list price. Right now, you can get a stainless steel integrated bracelet Rolex sports watch uh, with Gerald Genta design, and that is the Datejust Oyster Quartz 17,000. And I say Gerald Genta because years ago, while the Oyster Quartz was still in production, Gerald Genta said that he only designed one watch for Rolex, but it was still in production. Now, I've heard through authorities that absolutely know their stuff and can be trusted that the 1971 Rolex 5100 Beta 21 was designed by Gerald Genta. It was an integrated bracelet sports watch. It was in gold, white gold or yellow, but it was a Gerald Genta design, and he consisted of, uh, well, frankly, all of the great designs of the era with integrated bracelets had some link to Genta, but the real thing that matters here is that he considered the Oyster Quartz, which translated the 5100's design, he considered the Oyster Quartz to be a continuation of his own design. The same way, for example, the 5711 is a continuation of the design of the 3700. Genta considered the Oyster Quartz to be his watch. Now, try to buy a Nautilus, a Royal Oak, or a Jumbo Engineer from that period for $5,000. So this was a landmark movement, a technical tour de force, aesthetically outstanding and emblematic of both its era and its designer. Um, the movement is both a lifetime movement and technically quite impressive. Consider that it had a Swiss lever escapement to step the hand precisely, the seconds hand. Not every quartz watch has a Swiss lever escapement. In fact, this is the only one I can think of that does. Second, it had a thermocompensation circuit, which meant it was able to deal with fluctuations in temperature, hot or cold. It also featured a quartz trimmer, which is the reason I say this is a lifetime movement, because over time, a quartz crystal, its frequency will drift a little bit, and having a trimmer built into the movement allows the watchmaker to adjust for that over decades. It was modular, so if one piece, a transistor, a motor, the escapement, wore out, it could be replaced in service, and it's one of the rare COSC 
quartz chronometers. Very few were made and very few have been made. Breitling today is pretty much the only company that still goes in for the quartz chronometer certification and every single date just Oyster quartz, made from 1978 forward, was a quartz chronometer. That is a huge feather in its cap. This is a real collectible. Not yet an investment watch, though prices are creeping up a little bit. Uh, this is a watch that was built in about 1,000 pieces a year on average for 25 years. Does that sound rare by Rolex standards? Yeah, that sounds rare by Patek Philippe standards. So th there were 25,000. Many of them have been busted. Many of them have been melted down because they were precious metal pieces during the late 80s or during the 2009 gold surge. Or many of them have just been refinished unattractively to the point that they're no longer worth wearing. So if you can find a survivor in good shape, you've got something that is exceptionally rare and very special. And if you want a historically significant Rolex for five grand, here it is. Now I will say this, there are many different dials from which to choose. I prefer black or blue, but they're all quite handsome. And as most of these watches were made in the tritium era, you're gonna get a nice real tritium patina along with that integrated bracelet and case design. I'll also mention these are no longer common at $5,000. I threw these in because if I were to do this show again in six months, I think you'd have trouble finding even one of these for five grand. But I was able to find a few of these before showtime for $5,000 or nearly. So I'm gonna say this is like the last pass to get one of these cheap. I do think prices will rise, not as quickly as the Oyster Quartz day dates, but I don't think these are being shunned or forgotten anymore. This train is leaving the station. You will wish someday, and I will wish someday, that we bought two. One for the wrist and one for the safe. Let's see what we've got right here. Okay, we got Edward Ledden saying, William Messena, who is a watch collector and now a constructor, is an Oyster Quartz owner and fan. Let's see what else is going on. Jonathan O saying, I can't get excited by anything Quartz. I, I would say open your mind. Like, there don't, don't shut it out. Like, there was a time back in the early 20th century when people used to say, well, you know what? The car is cold and dead. It doesn't have a heartbeat or a mind or a soul. I could never feel the same emotion about a car that I feel about a horse. You know, and now today we're like, oh, I could never feel the same emotion about an electric car that I do about a gas car. I think that same sort of, I don't know, hesitancy to embrace something different, uh, plays on our minds as watch collectors. I didn't warm up to quartz immediately, but I think it's got a lot to offer. And there is a difference between like Happy Meal quartz watch and luxury quartz watch. And then we've got Tim Wright saying, I'm surprised that Gerald Genta didn't do anything funny with the bezel when he was designing this day chest. Well, he didn't design it directly. He designed the 5100. And if you look at the Rolex 5100 from 1970 and you compare it to the 17,000, it's clear that the Oyster Quartz adopted his design pretty much wholesale, but with detail changes, probably so they didn't have to pay him more royalties. Um, the thing is, he considered the Oyster Quartz still to be his 5100 design with modifications. And then we've got John N saying, it looks really small, smaller than the old 36 millimeter date just. I always found the opposite. When I wear an Oyster Quartz because the integrated bracelet, it's the same thing as with a 5711 or like an Audemars Piguet 15500. It feels bigger than its rated size, but that's just me. Okay, now jumping straight into Oh, what about these prices we're seeing, guys? I don't know what's going on here. I mean, I understand broadly that it's a much sought watch, that it's a social media star, that the manufacturer said it's discontinuing the model, but this is just one model among many that are doing stupid things on the markets. And again, I always say buy ahead of the market, whether it's cars or watches, which is why I'm saying buy the Oyster Quartz now this this is difficult to understand. Like, why do you think these watches cost so much at the moment? It's only a couple of references from a couple of brands. If someone sells a used Zeitwinkel, I guarantee you it's not going to sell for 300% of its retail price or 400% of its retail price. If I try to sell a Mont Blanc Nicolas Riosec chronograph, which is a superior product, I'm going to take a bath and probably sell that to a wholesaler for like 45 cents on the dollar. So it's not like every brand and every model is suddenly worth a mint. It's just, I don't know if we're honest, like maybe a dozen model families from maybe four brands. The whole thing just seems wrong. And I see Terry C saying the price is knuckin' futz, and I got to agree with you on that. We got Melotonin saying my salary does not even reach $130,000. And John, and what the hell with these prices? I got to agree with you guys. It just, it doesn't make any sense to me. 
I don't know who's buying these things. I strongly suspect it's mostly not watch collectors, or at least not people who are hardcore about the hobby. There's a big fashion and designer factor to a lot of the watches that are now popular, and I would say the only one that's like still really a, a watch collector watch is the Chronomet Bleu. The Chronomet Bleu is a great value at twenty, thirty, dollars even $40,000, but now that we're seeing 60, 70, 80, I don't know. Guys, I got an alternative and I think you're gonna like it, but first, let's talk about the Nomos Autobahn Neomatic 41. This is a watch designed by Werner Isingler, uh, Isingler, who, guys, it's just one of those days, you know, Mondays, like I'm always on on a Monday. So I got the Mondays every time I come on this show. Werner Eislinger, sorry sir, of Berlin designed this watch and he's mostly a furniture designer. What he designed was easily co-equal the best watch of 2018. Like this came out in 2018 alongside the Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter and I felt like wow, Nomos finally designed a watch that fires on all cylinders and it's not just a metaphor, 41 millimeter stainless steel with a world class caliber DUW 6101. This is an automotive themed watch that's 100 meters water resistant, it's dress watch thin, it's gorgeous at night like an old electroluminescent Chrysler dashboard and there are as I mentioned endless automotive references on the dial. You've got a bowl-shaped dial that references the interwar racetracks at Monza and Brooklands and Indianapolis. You've got details on the scales, the fonts, and the layout, the shape of the hands that reference automotive dashboards of the 50s and 60s. And Mr. Eislinger, I, mod I modified badly, let's even say mangled your name, Mr. Eislinger is a German designer, Werner Eislinger, who basically does furniture and now does dials. He's done one watch for Nomos and it is an absolute gem. Let's see what else is going on right here. $4,800 new, with many available used under $4,000. I gotta say, all things considered right here, you're looking at an absolute bargain. This is a manufacturer movement, a brilliant design by an acknowledged artist. It comes from a company that's on rock solid financial footing. It's a German watch in a world of Swiss watches. It's an independent brand in a world of group brands. And again, because it's thin, it's steel, it's water resistant, it's loomed, and it's automatic. It can be your dress watch and it can be your sports watch. I would also say this, because you're gonna bring it up, I know I'm wearing a Zin, I'm wearing a watch that should qualify, um, but here's the thing. Zin gets so much love on this channel, I'm just gonna briefly mention the U50. The U50 came out last year, $2,920 on a full steel tegmented bracelet with a full tegmented steel case and bezel. It is a superior 41 millimeter dive watch option and you won't have to wait two years or sell a kidney to afford it. I happen to love this watch, but I just don't have time to add too many Zins to this feature because we could do just Zin under $5,000. Or an accessible craft level watch. Let's talk about the GPHG nominated Sartori Billard SB04. This is a gorgeous watch that you can buy for about $3,700 in titanium with a largely handmade dial and a hand finished case. Uh, the SB04 is a special piece with a debatoon worthy fired blue titanium dial. And I do mean that. It's as good as the fired blue titanium of debatoon. But here's the thing, guys. If you're gonna do a blue dial these days and you're gonna spend around five grand getting it, I can't deny that the Grand Seiko SPGA 407, the Skyflake, is probably the coolest single option. This watch just drips with charisma. We're gonna cheat a bit here because you deserve, you deserve truth in advertising and I promised you $5,000 watches and this is a $5,800 watch. Well, if you're skilled with negotiation, you can get darn close to our $5,000 mark, bargain, Eh, subtract maybe three, four hundred dollars. Get this one new, because it's worth buying new. I've seen it for 5,000 used, but not commonly. And I'll also say, take note, you can find the original Snowflake. If you do want a Snowflake, but you don't need it to be blue and you don't want the vintage case, you can get one easily for under $5,000. Mechanically identical, aesthetically different, but still a classic. Either way, you're getting a watch that looks probably three times its actual price. The Skyflake dial gives this watch identity. The closer you get, the more impressive it appears. The dial requires multiple steps, over half a dozen steps to create. The individual indices, the hands, the frame for the date, the fired blue seconds hand, all of this handcrafted and minutely so on tiny diamond tipped milling tools. The case, of course, is black polished with Zeratsu tin plate finish. This is a handmade watch and a laboriously handmade watch inside and out. The hand finished case puts roll 
Netflix and Omega to shame because robots are doing that work in Switzerland. And this thing's only 40.2 millimeters, which means the size is perfect. This is one of the best new watches from 2019, and it's still one of the best you can buy. It's a distinct identity from the Snowflake because of the so-called 3180 vintage case. Despite the fact, though, that it is very different on a strap instead of a bracelet with the vintage case rather than the broader modern case, I will still say that this timepiece as 100 meters water resistant is a sports watch in spite of all. It is surprising in that regard and surprisingly versatile. It has the spring drive technology, accurate to 15 seconds a month. It is a technical tour de force just as the Oyster Quartz was in its day. And Grand Seiko makes me wonder, this Grand Seiko makes me wonder, why you would pay $60,000 for an FP Journe Chronomet Bleu if you can buy this for less than 10% of the price new with a warranty. This would be my choice. Again, just open your mind to the possibilities. You're getting something that is very impressive and you're getting it without the weight and without the markup, though with much respect. Okay, start exploring after the show and you'll find more fantastic sub $5,000 watches than you ever imagined. It's behavior modification. I've done it to myself when I become too fixated on some car or watch that I knew would ruin me. A person will want that which he sees most often in a positive light, which is to say, take away the control that blogs and social medias and influencers have, you on, have on you right now and direct your attention to underrated gems and low key values. You won't miss spending $85,000 on a 5711 and you will discover new horizons and brands and products that will frankly excite you more by virtue of the thrill of discovery than all this worn out stuff that you're sick of seeing. Okay, let's see what you guys are saying right here. Do we got Evan Goff, late to the party from London. Thoughts on the IWC Petite Prince Pilot Chrono in this budget. Is there value there? I'd say any used IWC has value. Buying them new, you undertake a certain amount of jeopardy because they do depreciate, but buying them used means, yeah, hey, you're pretty well. You're pretty well off, you'll do just fine. Buying a used IWC, you shouldn't face any hazard unless it's decades old or a decade or more old and it needs service. Um, but buying a few months after the first owner, that's the way to buy an IWC. Let's see what else you guys are saying right here. Gil Mebson saying, Grand Seiko models are precise in every way, beautifully made. I got to agree with you right there. Uh, Enrique Cassiano saying, I love the power reserve on the Skyflake. Maybe I'm alone. No, I actually like it. I think it looks good. I think it's quirky, but I also think it's a little bit distinctive of the brand. And it's nice to have some design continuity from a brand that basically redesigns all of its watches every year. There are probably too many Grand Seiko designs for their own good, and having a little bit of consistency across the dials is a good thing from a branding perspective. Rooted Rotor saying, I love it except for the Powell Reserve, and Anthony M, Anthony N is saying the same thing. A dial like that shouldn't have a Powell Reserve or a second hand. I'm gonna say I could go either way on the Powell Reserve, but I do love that blued steel seconds hand. If you didn't have a seconds hand on a spring drive, you'd be missing out on that gorgeous glide that's so distinctive of the movement. And then Gary Smith saying, vintage Zenith and fade in space saying, finally got in the live show. St. Peter saying, Tim, how about Cartier with ETA movements? Good value, definitely. I, I think they're interesting watches. I think if you want best value in Cartier, you're either going to get the current Santos Large or go back to the 2008, back to 1998 CPCP collection. Those watches are great value. Not cheap, but great value. Okay, wrist shots. Number four, Dan T and the Moser Pioneer join me. Edouard Melon and my friends at a Zoom Moser event we did for our customers in Hong Kong. All in with the crew. We've got Edward B., Kicking back with a drink in his white Rolosaur, Rolex Sky Dweller. We've got Kai W. Forwards this baffling shot of his IWC pilot's chronograph and what appears to be a witch while at the wheel of his Audi. Larry A. and his white gold Patek Aquanaut share glory with Lumpy the bunny. That's an interesting pet shot right there. And Marcus T. takes us home with his enamel dial Patek 5078P minute repeater from the watch box. Thank you for trusting our company, Marcus. Guys, all the rest of you, join me on Facebook after the show. Talking Time with Tim Masso is my Facebook group. I'd love to see you there. Time out, Tim out. Thanks so much to Sean. And thanks you for logging on.